I have to be honest and say that I had not met Sui prior to her presentation at uh, Nanos. Uh, and uh, at that meeting, uh, they had a session that was more or less dedicated to visual snow syndrome. Uh, Sui presented her work, which showed that um, using mindfulness techniques, which I believe were based on the Oxford uh, mindfulness uh, programs, uh, they were able to, she was able to demonstrate that over a period, I think it was uh, uh, 8 and 12 weeks or 8 and 16 weeks, that there was a significant subjective improvement in patients um, with uh, visual snow syndrome. And, and let's be clear here that what we're trying to do when we treat anybody is to make them feel better. Almost everything else is irrelevant. So the fact that she could make them feel better with mindfulness was a big step forward uh, on its own uh, without anything else being considered. But she had combined this with uh, functional MRI and showed, as has been shown with mindfulness in the past, that there were actually changes in functional connections within the brain. So in some way, shape or form, we're modifying the programming because the structure can't change. The actual hardwiring cannot change, but the, the software programming can change. Now, uh, I, thought, I found that incredibly exciting uh, to the extent that I, I sought Swear out and had a long discussion with her afterwards. I thought it was the most uh, exciting uh, step forward in visual snow that I'd come across in uh, all the time that we'd been working in the area. Um, you can't make any criticism of the work because it was a pilot study, and so it was a small number. But it was statistically significant, okay? And, and uh, you can say that uh, statistics are to scientists like a lamppost is to a drunk man, used more for support than illumination. However, they really are valid, and her, her figures were, were, were solid, any way you looked at them. Needed to be validated with a much larger study, okay? And that's what she's in the process of doing now. Uh, again, I would prefer if the study was going to be done with functional MRI all the time as well, but uh, that's also quite expensive. And in the long run, as I said, Functional outcomes are what's important, and she's continuing with the functional uh, study on a, a significantly larger number of patients. The main um, benefit of the functional MRI is that, that it demonstrates that we are modifying programs, uh, and that modifying programs is associated with modifying perception and function, so that um, uh, more than that, we, we've never really understood entirely uh, which part of which uh, uh, network is primarily responsible uh, for the generation of all of the symptoms of visual snow syndrome. And I suspect that there are different networks that are responsible for different parts. Uh, but the fact that we can modify uh, functional connectivity implies that the programs are being changed. And that's, that's, I think, the main value of the study. I prefer the, uh, the mindfulness MBCT um, study because it's very physiological. Uh, and I think that, um, uh, that this is uh, visual snow syndrome, as I've said, is, I believe, uh, an abnormality of function predicated on impaired software programming. And this is the one thing that specifically uh, addresses underlying programming uh, from, from other studies as well as from uh, Sui's uh, early studies. Now, there, there have been other attempts at, 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 at looking at this, uh, 40 hertz stimulation, um, uh, um, magnetic stimulation of cortex, etc. Uh, and so far they've just failed. It doesn't mean that they might not have an effect, uh, but they're harder to access and, they're, uh, and they haven't been as successful 
or we haven't got the right paradigms. Now, with uh, the mindfulness, firstly, you could do that anywhere. Secondly, uh, the cost of doing it is minuscule. Uh, thirdly, it seems to be effective. So I'm really optimistic that um, all of the uh, criteria for an easily distributed uh, effective therapy are met. Uh, it just needs validation. And I'm optimistic on the basis that the science behind it is solid. Uh, yes, there are. Um, at the moment, uh, the best, uh, uh, the single most effective uh, treatment we have uh, for patients is explaining what they've got and encouraging them that they're not crazy uh, and they're not mig they don't have migraine, etc. Now, as I said, there are a number of associated disorders, and you can tackle each and every one of those independently to try and reduce the overall dysfunction uh, and hopefully they are then able to cope with their current visual snow. There have been various medications that have been promulgated and it, a day doesn't go by that somebody doesn't send me an email saying what about this drug, what about that drug. Uh, the only medication that has been shown to have any effect in visual snow syndrome is lamotrigine which works to some degree in no more than 19% of patients. Uh, there was some very interesting work done by uh, Claire Fraser uh, when she was in London on the, and in, in Sydney uh, on the use of uh, uh, coloured lenses uh, as a filter. And that does seem to have an effect on the severity of the visual snow in a, in a percentage of patients. And the, the really nice thing about it is it really adheres to the mo maxim of uh, first do no harm. Uh, so, that, so it is something that's w it's worth trying and I, I do recommend to patients that they might like to try that. And many patients of, on their own uh, have recognised that sunglasses will, will help them to some degree with the light sensitivity and sometimes the snow's not as, as, as evident. Uh, a number of other patients have found that they can habituate themselves to it and I think that came out in the first ever meeting in San Francisco. One of the speakers there had found that by staring at, at a visual snow type, type screen uh, intermittently he could actually su suppress his visual snow. Again, does no harm. Does it work for everybody? No. Firstly, I, I believe that the, the major benefit has been from the one-to-one -one interaction between the patient and the therapist, uh, and, I think, and I think it works. But it's a very expensive therapy that can't possibly be uh, generalised to the rest of the community. I, I, I'm aware of the neurooptometry, and I'm aware of the exercises, etc., and I'm aware of, of the uh, successes that they report with, with patients. I think that it's... Uh, darting around the edges of retraining the brain in general because you're making them do things. My uh, inclination was to be very sceptical, uh, mainly because they were talking about eye movements uh, and our own uh, uh, research, which is looking at eye movements in, in, in far greater detail, uh, suggests that from a functional perspective, the eye movements are normal. Uh, but if you look at what they're doing, they are, they are doing retraining. So we come to uh, what uh, I'm hopeful will be uh, a, a significant therapy that will be very easily generalised, and that is the use of mindfulness. Absolutely. Um, there is still uh, a large number of people who believe this is a psychological problem and you should just get over it. That's rubbish. Uh, it, using a word that uh, will be acceptable to most of the world. Um, I feel a bit more strongly about it than that. Uh, the, the, the concept that this is a psychological disorder is just harmful. Harmful to the patients and harmful to the development of proper therapies. Uh, secondarily, the concept that migraine uh, 
is is the cause uh, is is not harmful, but it's not helpful. Uh, migraine is a very common comorbidity uh, and needs to be treated on its own merits. Um, apart from that, no, there are no major misconceptions. Uh, you know, the, the the harmful one is the concept of it being psychological and failing to provide uh, appropriate support uh, for a patient who has a true disability. There is no doubt uh, that it would uh, provide validation for the med medical community in, in general that uh, visual snow is a, a separate disorder uh, and um, that it it should be considered as such and that that diagnosis should be coded. Um, that's actually possibly not its greatest benefit because the vast majority of doctors who see patients have no idea of what the ICD-11 is. People <coughs> involved in research or, or and academic pursuits or who work in, in, in large hospitals constantly have to code uh, and in fact in some places, sorry, in some places, uh, the reimbursement to hospitals is based on on diagnostic-related groups, uh, and consequently, having uh, they're they're very aware of, of ICD ICD-10 as it is at the moment, ICD-11 as it will be in the future. Where it will probably have uh, the greatest effect is it will enable us to. Uh, gather statistical information about the frequency and severity of uh, visual snow over time in that uh, there will be a larger number of people collecting that data and a larger number of uh, uh, clinicians involved. That will be uh, the major benefit. Essentially, from the patient perspective, it makes it much more likely that they will be treated by a clinician who is aware that it is a real entity and therefore that they will be uh, either validated, and validation for patients is very important, uh, and hopefully uh, in the future uh, they will be um, uh, able to enter into a therapeutic program that will be effective for them. Uh, for researchers, of course, it's uh, of the essence to provide data that we can work with. The insurance issue is really an American issue. Uh, we're, in, we're in a country where people are treated uh, uh, and most treatment is supported by government subsidy, uh, no matter what. Uh, visits to doctors, etc., uh, are, are supported. And there might be a co-payment, but not substantially. In the American system, uh, you go to a doctor and almost everything that doctor does during an interview and a consultation uh, is uh, coded and attracts a certain fee. So a fee for a consultation is a, a composite fee depending on what's done. And then insurance companies recognize what they're going to pay for and what they're not going to pay for. And they almost, and so what gets charged, what gets paid uh, is a negotiation between the doctor and the insurance company. Here, and in much of the world, there's a fee for a consultation. It doesn't matter what happens in the consultation. There's a fee. Uh, and a, a substantial proportion of that is covered by uh, government insurance schemes. So I, I, can, I can envisage that it would have very substantial impact for patients in the United States. But, but not many other countries work in the same way that the United States health system works. You have the best and the worst. <laughs>